Mary, um, which I guess is a lot of sort of machine learning and um, sort of audio-based analysis. It was really quite different from the way we work. So I was trying to think of ways to link it up. Um, so I'll have like little bits of bits and pieces of things that um, might be of interest or relevant for you in this talk. Um, but for the most part, the talk is kind of like a big, uh, it's just a roundup of like really everything to do with sound synthesis, virtual acoustics and audio effects um, where there's um, physics-based modeling going on underneath it. Okay, so let me just start off by saying a bit about physics-based audio. Um, it's, um, it's an exercise in simulation. And you can sort of think about it in an analogy with um, with computer animation. So you can think about the kinds of things people do in in graphics, like um, modeling the dynamics of objects, so like bouncing balls or breaking glass or what have you. And then, sort of independently from this, you've got the problem of illumination. So I guess in graphics, they do with these kind of separately. So you model the dynamics of your objects and then you illuminate the scene by using some kind of, um, I guess in the best case, you'd use some kind of ray tracing algorithm. Um, and then in audio, we're sort of doing something similar. So we have our uh, sound synthesis where our input is some kind of control data, right? Sub audio rate uh, control um, and our output is audio. And um, so we're modeling the way in which these instruments vibrate and produce sound. And then um, there's the kind of the, the virtual acoustic side where here we would take audio to be the input and then we would treat like a room or something as an effect. So the output would be audio as well. Um, and you know, like all analogies, like this one kind of breaks down if you push it too far. And then when you start particularly to think about things like audio effects, um, which I can't really think of an analog for in the, in the um, graphics world, but you know, the, I guess the room is one example of an effect, but there are others too. Um, so there are things like plate reverb, sort of mechanical reverb, spring reverbs, that kind of stuff, where again, the input is audio and the output is audio, but here, like, it, it's not the room uh, changing the sound, it's some other device. And then, you know, something like an electronic effect. So something like, a, like what I have here is the circuit schematic for a, a voltage controlled filter for the, for the MOOC. Okay. Um, and in physics-based audio, like in all cases, all of them, in fact, we're, we're really designing numerical differential equation solvers. And they're all um, deterministic. So there's no um, kind of statistical component at all, really, to any of the work we do. And you might think that, you know, the sound's going to be kind of like boring or lacking in character because of that. But actually, the, um, the nonlinearities in the differential equations kind of save the day because there's all sorts of interesting behavior um, that comes out of them that makes that enlivens the sound. And I'll, uh, I'll get to some examples of that in a bit. Okay, so the very beginnings um, are is something called Kelly Lockbaum uh, speech synthesis, which uh, which first appeared in 1961 and it was developed by uh, Carol Lockbaum, John Kelly at Bell Labs. And the idea for them uh, was to design a speech synthesizer based on a model of the vocal tract, which they uh, wrote in terms of a set of concatenated acoustic tubes, which they were able to you know, vary in time over the course of an utterance to give you a, some kind of time varying uh, vowel sound. And this worked uh, really well. Um, and it's interesting because these days, you know, Kelly Lockbaum, I mean, it got used a lot. I mean, I think it was probably the basis for the like the speak and spell from TI, I guess, in the 70s. But people don't often think about that as a physical model, partly because there's um, there's a link with um, linear prediction uh, or linear predictive coding, which uh, which allows you to actually calculate the um, the parameters for the physical model, but through a kind of a signal based method. So it's not often thought of as a physical model, but it is. Um, so you know, speech synthesis you could do uh, in real time uh, a while ago. Uh, because it was pretty cheap. You didn't need that many tubes to represent the vocal tract. But to do anything like more musical, like a string or, you know, anything else, um, you really had to wait until the 1980s for computer power to catch up. And there were a lot of different techniques that, um, that appeared. So here are some of the classics. So um, modal synthesis is one of the best known. So the idea here is to um, take your vibrating object, decompose its vibration into modes, um, if you can, and that's the case if the system is linear and time invariant, you, can, you have this decomposition at hand. And then you can then reconstruct the sound partial by partial um, 
uh, in order to get the output sound. And this was um, pioneered at uh, IRCOM, sort of mid 80s, gave rise to something called Modalist, which is a uh, synthesis environment which still exists today. Um, and then there were waveguides, uh, which came out of uh, Stanford also in the 1980s. And this is a very different um, way to, uh, or approach to physical modeling. So here we have our system. Let's take again the case of a string. And, you know, if um, you can satisfy a few pretty strict hypotheses, like, for example, that the waves travel in the string without distortion, um, they travel uh, through each other without interacting at a constant speed, then you can arrive at a very efficient um, algorithm for simulation in terms of delay lines. And this, the discovery of this algorithm made it possible to do real-time physical modeling in the 1980s. And it was, became the basis later for the Yamaha VL1, which came out in 1994. Um, and then there are kind of more um, general methods sort of imported from other areas of engineering, like mechanical engineering, for example, where you might just take your system, represent its behavior over a grid, um, and then simply time advance it. And this is kind of the classic way of doing things. Like if you were a mechanical engineer, didn't know anything about physical modeling or presented with solving that problem, this is probably what you'd do. Um, and here, I guess, like this is more expensive than doing something with like a waveguide, but it's also more general. So you're not restricted by um, any kind of hypotheses like, uh, like traveling wave solutions or the existence of modes. You can really deal with anything, but then you pay a price for this generality in terms of compute cost. These days, though, it's not so severe. So these are the kind of methods that we use up here, at least in the group. Okay, so um, let me now um, take you through a few uh, case studies um, in terms of sound synthesis. And um, I also wanted to focus a little bit on the string because I wanted to, um, to introduce this idea of a kind of an underlying small parameter space to describe all these physical models, which are, you know, the models are big complicated equation systems, but usually underneath them, there's maybe just a handful of numbers which, which um, kind of serve to parameterize the whole space of sounds you can get out. And it's useful to know this um, when you're working with these. Uh, there's this kind of redundancy built into uh, to all the sounds you could possibly get out. So let's just take the case of the ideal string first. So um, the ideal string is described by something called the wave equation, uh, which is a second order PDE uh, in the string displacement. Um, as a function of its uh, of spatial coordinate and also time. And it depends really on just two physical parameters. So we've got the wave speed and the length, and that's it. And from these two, in fact, there's only one parameter which is perceptually significant, which is the fundamental frequency. And if you have a listen to this, um, this model, I mean, it's, uh, it's pretty basic and it's really, you just get kind of a, a steady pitch. Did everyone hear that, by the way? Yes. Great, okay. Um, so quite simple. And then the whole game in physical modeling is to introduce um, more terms until you can start to approximate the sound of a real uh, instrument. So this is too simple, obviously. So what's missing? Well, you can add another term into this differential equation um, representing effects of stiffness here. So now there are two parameters. Um, so the, in the case of the wave equation, you know, the, the, the string had to be supported by tension in order to vibrate. So it was completely limp, like a piece of spaghetti or something. And this system uh, has um, inbuilt stiffness. So it's able to support vibration, even if it's not tensioned. And what you start to hear are changes in both the pitch and the timbre as you increase this uh, stiffness parameter. So here's with no stiffness. So what you start to hear is these effects of inharmonicity and also something closer to something you might get out of a bar, like if you were to strike it. Okay, still though, even at this point, um, the sounds are quite static. Um, you would expect there to be some kind of decay. And in fact, this is just due to the losses. So the very simplest model for loss involves a new third parameter. And this kind of gives you a global uh, like T60 for the uh, for sound decay. So here's the kind of sound you would get out. 
Um, but actually for, for real physical systems, you tend to lose more energy at high frequencies um, more quickly. So requiring an additional term in the, in the PD. And here's what you would get out in that case. So now that's sort of getting closer to the kind of sound you might get out of say a guitar string or something. Um, so, so far we're at four parameters now. And then it's interesting what happens if you introduce one more term into this equation. So here is now a nonlinear model of string vibration. This is the very simplest one there is. There are many families of these, but this is the easiest one to deal with. And it just introduces one more free parameter. Um, and this gives rise to effects which are uh, amplitude dependent. So the, the harder you strike or pluck the string, the, more, the greater the effect will be. And it's, uh, it's pretty interesting to see just how large the effect is actually. So here's a spectrogram of sound output under nonlinear conditions. And what you see is um, like, first of all, like under say five increased strikes of increasing strength. And you can see for the first one here, you see pretty much just linear behavior. But then like as the striking amplitude goes up, you see a few effects here. So first of all, you see something like a kind of a pitch glide here. So the pitch is initially higher and then decreases. And then you also see this kind of granularity appearing there in the spectrograms, which um, you have to kind of hear to understand. But I'll just play you for contrast here, what you get out of the linear system. So this is for five strikes of increasing amplitude. So, I mean, in the linear case, those five sounds are actually identical. They're just scaled in amplitude. But in the nonlinear case, you start to get a lot of um, pretty weird effects happening. So, I mean, there's clearly like this kind of pitch glide effect, but there's all sorts of other kind of weird, like um, almost like warbling sounds appearing there. Um, and they're all just due to this one extra parameter there. Um, and then, you know, you can go further and further with this. So, for example, if you were to then introduce uh, something along the lines of what you might find in a prepared piano, it's a little, say, rattling element um, sitting there on the string on two strings. Now we've introduced a few more parameters just to describe that thing, like for example, how heavy it is, or uh, how stiff it is, or how um, how far apart those two little arms of it are. Um, then you get into really kind of wild territory sound-wise. So here's some uh, sound examples. Okay, so, um, so you can see like, you know, the, the parameters don't all have, you know, equal effects. Like for the linear system, like the parameters kind of control very basic things like pitch or maybe decay time. Here, like, like we're not really sure what these parameters are doing, but they seem to do a lot. Um, so, um, okay, so let me just now move over to some full environments. So, uh, you know, once you've got one string, you know, you can of course have as many as you like of these. And one thing we built, um, was a full model of the guitar. So this is a, a little more involved than just a pluck string because we have um, uh, full models of all the fingers too. And you can use the fingers either to pluck or tap with, or you could use them to stop the stringers against, uh, stop the fingers against the fretboard. And you get a pretty wide variety of sounds out here as well. Um, so here's a, um, here's sort of basic strums. But then, um, I don't know what this one is. Oh yeah, that's um that's a bar chord. So you've got um, a stopping hand against uh, the strings, and you're moving it up in the course of a gesture. And you know what you hear there is not just a change in the in the, the chords, but also you hear this kind of rattling effects, which are due to the sort of partial trapping of the strings against the um, the fretboard. Um, and then you can do sort of um, like uh what's it called sultasto i forget what it's called when you hold the strings down uh just a little bit um so you damp out most of the harmonics but playing on the harmonics i guess you call it okay so i mean just to just to indicate here that um like we can build these things but um learning how to play them is actually a huge undertaking um like we're not sure you know exactly how to control all these things um so it's, it's, there's a big learning process that goes on when you're working with a musician or something and trying to figure out how to set the numbers to, to you know, to get, you know, gestures similar to those which we know from the real world. Um, 
Okay, and then there's um, brass instruments. So this, um, you know, these all these families have their own challenges. Um, like for brass, um, the the challenges is really just trying to get decent sound out at all, which is very different from the case of something like a guitar, which always produces some kind of sound. Like here, like as you know, if you've ever tried to play a brass instrument, you need to kind of you know hit the right um, lip stiffness and pressure in order to get a decent sound out, and that's like kind of the tricky thing here. Um, but then there are also design issues too. So for full brass instrument. Uh, you want to make decisions about, say, what the board profile looks like, how wide the bell is, you know, where your valves are and stuff. And from a control perspective, um, there's a little more to do here, too, because it's um, it's different from something like a like a guitar where you might have an impulsive excitation here. You know, to control this thing, you have to supply a whole uh, like pressure stream, like sub audio rate. Um, data that you need to supply over the course of the gesture. So both for the pressure and also for the stiffness of your lips and potentially also the valve positions if you're gonna be playing this thing. So there's a lot of, a lot more data coming in. Um, so I'll just play you a few sounds. I mean, uh, like as I mentioned, it's hard to get sound out. So when you're first um, kind of messing around with these instruments, you tend to get out these kind of sounds. So it's, it's difficult to even to hit a steady tone unless you, you know, you hit the lip stiffness and the pressure like right. And then once you learn the range over which you can get these steady tones, then you can do simple, you say, play up the harmonics. And then with a bit more work, you can get into more interesting gestures like this, for example. And I always like playing this example because I, I try to get people to imagine how difficult it would be to get these sounds out if you had, if you were working with, say, a big database of, um, you know, recorded uh, fragments of, of brass instrument sounds, like trying to get all those transitions, like it would just require like immense um, uh, tables of, of kind of pre-recorded fragments in order to do that. So, so this is here in this case, there's no uh, I mean, there's no no memory requirement for these uh, for these algorithms, no storage, right? Because it's everything's being done algorithmically. And then finally, you know, like when you give this stuff to a musician, I mean, what they tend to do is to go for the, you know, the biggest possible instrument they can build, and you get into this range of really weird stuff. Like this is something from um, there's a musician named uh, Trevor Wishart you might have heard of, who's an uh, English um, composer, and his first thought was to, to do like a 10 meter trumpet, you know, and this is kind of what you get out. I'm not sure it'll even come out just because there's so much low frequency stuff here, but you may hear it if you got headphones on. Okay, anyway. Uh, and then, okay, and then there's percussion. So um, like percussion instruments are, are different again. So now the control is a lot simpler. Um, so here we're just dealing with simple strikes. Now the, the problem is the, the compute costs because in order to do percussion at all, you really have to work in 3D. And once you're in 3D, as I'll show later, like you start to get into very large um, compute cost uh, requirements. So here's an example of say um, a timpani drum. And then here's a snare drum, and this is a this is a tricky one actually because there's a there's really kind of a lot of moving parts in this one. So the the snare drum has two membranes. There's an enclosed cavity of air, um, and there's also radiation, of course, to the uh, to the outside of the instrument. But then on top of that, there's these wires attached to one of the membranes, which uh, which vibrate against it, and which produce this uh, noisy timbre that will be familiar to you. So. Okay, so that kind of stuff I should say right away, that's way uh, offline still. I mean, even now, like that's those sounds, I did them about 10 years ago. Um, but even now, like it would just be impossible to do that on, a, on your CPU in real time. So uh, it'd be faster now, but still way out of real time. Okay, and then finally, um, the fun bit is, um, is coming up with environments that musicians can, uh, can play around with where they get to build their own 
uh, instrument sets. And the simplest thing to do, of course, is just to put several of these instruments into the same acoustic space. And so here's a set of timpani. Um, like the interesting thing here is that these all kind of talk to each other, right? So if you hit one of these drums, it'll set the acoustic field into motion, but that will also set the other membranes into vibration as well. So here's a four timpani, I think, in a room. But then you can get into other stuff too. So here's a set of, um, this is a gong set that we built that got used um, a fair amount by composers as well. So you would place uh, several nonlinear gongs in the same acoustic space. And again, they're sort of in contact with each other through the acoustic field. Um, and then finally, there are like completely abstract uh, concoctions you can come up with. So here is a, um, a freeform uh, modular synthesis environment bunch, involving a bunch of plates, which you can connect together with um, nonlinear connectors. And here's like, I think this is an excerpt from a small piece that was done uh, ages ago by Gordon DeLapp in uh, Ireland. So now I just wanted to move over uh, to virtual acoustics for a little bit. Um, so here, um, like the, as I mentioned at the beginning, the, uh, the aim is different here. So now we're, um, we're talking about something more like an effect. So we have audio coming in and we want to um, simulate the effect of the room on the, the sound in order to produce a reverberated sound. And uh, in general, we're going to be solving some variant of the 3D wave equation. So uh, like algorithmically, these are, simpler than some of the things I've showed earlier, but it's really the size of the problem that's that makes it difficult. I mean, the wave equation itself is not particularly difficult to solve, but it's just the like the amount of um, uh, raw operations and the number the amount of memory required to do it is that's the problem. And I'll talk about that in a second. But um, let me just go back to what the state of the art is. So most um, Rendering algorithms uh, for 3D these days are based on uh, geometric ideas. So these have been around since the 60s. Um, it's ray tracing, really. So it's exactly the kind of same thing you would use if you were modeling um, uh, illumination. So you can think about a source uh, emanating rays, which travel in straight lines and which then reflect off um, any obstacles or the boundary of the, the space and which are then collected at some receiver, which could be like a microphone or your ear or something. Um, now, the problem is in acoustics, um, like in, in, you know, in, in graphics, this is a, you know, a great, you know, approximation to, to what's going on in, in the real world. It's barely an approximation at all. In acoustics, it's, it's an approximation. Let's just talk about how good that is. I mean, there's, the problem is that there's these, these effects of diffraction. So if you're operating at very high frequencies, um, so in this case, we have a point source emanating high frequencies. There's some kind of barrier in front of it. And you can see there's a pretty well-defined shadow region uh, behind the obstacle, which is in line with what you would find if you were using geometric methods. However, um, at lower frequencies, you get um, waves pretty much moving right through the obstacle. Um, so there's diffraction around it. And this is, of course, very different from what you would get out of a, of a geometric method. And, you know, in, in the real world, like uh, the wavelengths of interest, the wavelengths that correspond to the, the range of human hearing run from about, <coughs> about two centimeters up to about 17 meters. So like for the most part, they're larger than the obstacles in the space. So in fact, we're, we're most of the time we're in this uh, regime where we have to deal with diffraction. So the geometric approximation is really not good at all. Um, so what some people are doing, so our group works on this, there are others too, um, is trying to do full 3D models of wave propagation in kind of relatively complex uh, acoustic spaces. So this is a full concert hall. And um, just to show you the difference between what you would get out of a geometric method and a wave-based method, I have uh, plots of the geometric method here on the right. So you can see the, uh, really the wave fronts uh, or the, you know, these are kind of like collections of, uh, of rays here emanating from a source. 
But on the left, we have uh, the wave-based simulation. You can see there's a lot more kind of detail actually in that simulation there is in the one, uh, the geometric one. And I'll just play a couple of sound examples here. So here's a, um, uh, a dry input sound. So it's just this is just a recording of a guitar. And then here's our processed audio out. So essentially, this is a you know a physically inspired reverb, right? So you could, I mean, you could do this obviously reverb a lot cheaper by using some. Uh, like a simplified algorithm, something like a, an FDN or something. But here, like, you know, if we're going to be working with people who want to design concert halls, like we want to give them an accurate representation of what the sound field will be uh, based on a physical model. Okay. Um, and then just uh, compute costs. Let me just come back to this now. So the, um, uh, the grid resolution you need is um, that's about a centimeter. And that's what is the source of all the computational difficulties um, that we experience when we're trying to simulate these things. Um, because in order to be able to uh, emulate uh, the effect of a room, we need to be able to, to get everything all the way up to about 20 kilohertz. And that means we have um, about 75 points, grid points per meter. But then for each cubic meter, that requires a kind of a number of grid points of about half a million. And, you know, if you consider then that concert halls may have upwards of, you know, 20,000 cubic meters volume, you're looking at very large, um, first of all, amounts of memory to look after, but also compute too, considering you need to update the field upwards of uh, 40,000 times a second. So we're looking at very large um, uh, problems. And then I just wanted to say a word about some of the more recent stuff we've been doing. Um, so there's uh, like, in the interest of trying to really emulate everything uh, as best we can, we've gotten very interested in these problems of, um, first of all, spatial encoding, but also source directivity. And um, one thing we've tried to do is to, uh, to incorporate um, relatively realistic uh, source directivity patterns like this one, say, which is being um, scrolled through as a function of frequency into the simulation. So this is a measurement of a directivity from a loudspeaker from Graz. And then we fit that down to uh, sixth order spherical harmonics um, and then reincorporated that into a uh, wave-based simulation. And we're able to, to get that um, pretty much exactly, I would say. Okay, and then finally, um, I just wanna get on to audio effects now. Um, and I'm not gonna talk about all audio effects. In particular, I'm not gonna talk so much about the electronic ones uh, because those are I guess those are much better known. Uh, there's a big literature on that. There's a little less literature on the mechanical ones, and that's the ones that we uh, really specialize in up here, in particular the plate reverb. Um, and the plate, uh, it's a it's a great system because it's uh, it's something that was this is something that was impossible to do in real time about ten years ago. Now it is possible, so it's kind of come online in the, in the intervening time. Um, and here, what we're doing is we're solving some variant of the equation which describes the vibration of a plate, uh, which looks kind of like the wave equation, except there's a, there's a fourth order derivative here now. And there are also additional terms there, uh, like allowing you to control the loss and T60 as a function of frequency and stuff. And this now forms the basis for a plugin that we've just put out uh, called PA1 from our kind of spin out company, Physical Audio. And I'll just play you uh, kind of a dry wet uh, sound uh, set here. So here's a dry, I think it's drum. And then here's the uh, processed out. That, I mean, that's obviously a little extreme that you might use in a, in a real recording, but that's just so you can hear the effect of the, um, uh, the plate. Um, but what I wanted to focus on a little bit here, just as a as kind of another more detailed example, uh, this is partly because I know there's a student at, at Queen Mary who's working on uh, spring reverbs and machine learning at the moment. So I thought it would be good to talk about this topic a little bit. So the spring is, um, 
It's a great system, actually. Um, and you know, weirdly, like it is, I think the single most complicated physical modeling object or system that I've ever seen. And it's strange because it's linear as well. Um, so if anybody ever says to you, you know, linear systems are easy, just show them this thing. Like it's really horrible, actually. And I'll, I'll get into why in a second. But um, so it's a classic um, electromechanical effect. It goes back to, I guess, the 1930s. I think the first designs were by Hammond. And here's a very simple unit. So this is a, like a tank with um, three springs in it. And it's all based on the vibration of um, helical springs. So the way it works is you have a driver at one end of the spring, and then you have a pickup at the opposite end. And it kind of imposes this uh, like complex, pretty complex response on it, um, which is does not really look like the response you'd get uh, out of a room, like in any sense. It has its own particular sound that sounds nothing like reverb in a in a in an actual room. But I guess like this is what they, you know, this is what they were trying to do back then. They were trying to get some kind of approximation to a room and they ended up with something which has an interesting sound all its own. But you can see it has all this, there are different kind of regimes there in the frequency domain. Um, so there's this kind of low frequency regime where you see these echoes, but then there are these kind of other echoes going on at a different rate and the higher range and stuff. And it's pretty messy. Um, and let's get into why that is actually. So um, the spring itself, um, can be characterized in terms of a relatively small number of parameters. So you can think about this in kind of an analogy with what we were saying about the string. We're talking about these small parameter spaces. For the spring, it's, it's also fairly small. So we've got parameters that follow from the material we choose. So the density, um, Young's modulus, or the stiffness of it, and then Poisson's ratio. So really just three. And then there are geometric parameters too. So there's the total unwound length of the of the spring there's the angle that the coil makes with respect to the i guess the cross section of the string there's the radius of the wire itself and then there's the radius of the entire coil and that's it um and it's there are seven of these numbers you need for the physical system and um, one really useful trick is to try to scale these down as much as you can by non-dimensionalizing and you can in fact get this down to four uh, that characterize really any spring. So you, it's, it's, I don't know, I guess if I were gonna go look at machine learning for spring reverbs, I would wanna know that there are really four numbers that are underlying any kind of spring reverb you could, you could measure. I would think it would be a useful way even to maybe label um, sounds or something if you were gonna do some kind of supervised learning approach. Um, but okay, let's just take a look at what these parameters do then. So let's start with the case of a straight wire. So not a helix, but just a wire. And for a straight wire, there are six kinds of motion that are possible. Um, here's one, so kind of a longitudinal one. Here's another one, which are kind of with the kind of like a torsional one. Here's a, there's a pair of transverse ones and there's a pair of kind of like shear ones too. And what I've plotted down here um, in the bottom right, these are dispersion relations for each of these types of motion. Um, and a dispersion relation is a plot of frequency against wave number. And I've also plotted here the limit of human hearing here as a, as a blue line. So anything below that blue line is these are effects we can hear. Um, and these are the things we want to model. Anything above that are things we can't hear. So we'd like ideally to be able to discard that part of the part of the model because we won't be able to hear it. Um, so now let's look at what happens if we start turning this wire into a spring reverb. So the first thing we might do is um, say curve our straight wire into a ring. And the effect you can see here, there are a couple of them. First of all, like a couple of these dispersion relations move above the threshold of human hearing, which is good because that means we can neglect them. And the other thing you see is this null appearing here. Um, and the null is due to cancellation that occurs uh, really at the wavelength corresponding to one turn around this ring. Okay, and then we can go even further. So suppose we now curve uh, our ring in the opposite direction. What you see is this, uh, this degeneracy between the lower two dispersion relations is broken there. And this gives rise actually to two separate um, rates of echoes occurring in a real spring reverb. So, I mean, the point here is you can learn a lot about 
um, what you actually hear by looking at pictures like this, if you get to know what they mean. And just show you that here, actually. Um, so I've got here uh, a picture of the two primary dispersion relations for the spring. And these are the only two that remain uh, in the audio range for reasonable size uh, or reasonable uh, choices of a spring. And then on the right, we've got here a response. And um, you can deduce all sorts of things from by looking at this picture of the, uh, the dispersion relations. So for example, these slopes that they take in the limit of low frequencies, well, these correspond to the rates of um, which echoes recur in the lower part of the spectrum. And then you can also see like at about three kilohertz here, there's a, there's a cutoff here. And that's the cutoff that you see between the two different ranges of, um, in the spectrogram there as well. So you can, um, I mean, you can map these curves directly over to the sort of gross behavior of the, uh, of the spectrogram. So it's useful to know this kind of stuff. Okay, um, and then this is also something that's possible to do in real time. Like as of, I think this year, we released uh, one, of our, one of our postdocs here, Michele Ducheski, who's also part of Physical Audio, put together a really great uh, Spring Reverb plugin. Um, and I'll just play a uh, dry, wet combo here again. So here's, I don't know what it is. Okay, and I just wanted to say a little more about a few um, possibly more technical aspects of, um, of uh, physical modeling. Um, one has to do with scale. So it's um, like this, the, the amount of computational work we need to do is gonna be determined by some number N, which is the number of degrees of freedom in our system. And you can think about that almost as the, like the price tag for, um, for a given system. Um, and very roughly the amount of memory you're gonna need and the number of operations per sample are gonna scale um, at best with this uh, number of degrees of freedom N. So what is it? I mean, it's a number you can actually deduce directly from the physical constants that describe the system. And it, just, it depends strongly on dimension. So for something like a string, um, it's pretty low. So it's on the order of about 50 to 200. And um, this is kind of like child's play these days. So the, the, this is the kind of thing you can easily do in real time. You can do many of these in real time and even in MATLAB or something. And similarly for wind instruments, they're pretty, it's pretty small too. And what this corresponds really to is the, is the number of grid points you're gonna need in order to represent the, uh, the instrument. Okay, and then when you move into 2D, however, um, that's when things start to get bigger. So dealing with something like a, you know, a plate or a membrane or something, then you're getting into the range from, you know, about 500 to about 100,000. So 100,000 is about how many you need for a bass drum membrane. And that's a lot uh, to deal with. And then there's kind of a big gulf and then you get to 3D. So for 3D spaces, um, you know, if you're talking about small ones, like the size of, uh, I don't know, like a smallish classroom or something, you're getting up towards, towards like close to a billion. Um, and then for large spaces, you're like way beyond a billion. So this is a lot really to cope with. And you start to run into, you know, issues of like running out of memory, even on your, your GPU or something, like if you're running on uh, some kind of off, off board card or something. Um, so we've done a lot of work on that over the last few years, like uh, trying to do uh, weight based acoustics on GPUs. And we managed to get a system up and running actually that was uh, that's able to take in as input a um, uh, something from say like a building spec from like Google SketchUp or something and then turn it into a uh, like a measured, an impulse response. Um, and this is the basis for a company that was formed with uh, Brian Hamilton, one of the postdocs here in the group called Remarical. Okay, and then the other big issue um, that we deal with a lot is it's a technical issue having to do with um, the stability of the algorithms that we're dealing with. And like, it's a big problem in physical modeling, um, mainly because the systems we're dealing with usually resonate a lot. So meaning they're low loss, and because the simulations can be really long. So you might be talking about, you know, millions of time steps or even requiring that these algorithms be capable of running in perpetuity without, uh, without breaking down, uh, if, it's, if it's something that's gonna be running as a plugin, say. 
and there, you know, you see this kind of behavior all over the place. So you might see instability occurring in, say, over the interior of a domain. So here's a membrane, a poorly designed algorithm for a membrane becoming unstable. Um, here's one occurring at a boundary like condition. So these boundaries are, are typical place you find these kind of instabilities uh, appearing. And then also like under all sorts of uh, conditions like say under connections. So if you're building some kind of modular network for synthesis, like you might have two really well-behaved components in isolation, but then when you connect them, you know, sometimes it may work. And then sometimes what you find is new instabilities emerging just due to the connection. And then finally, um, particularly in a nonlinear setting, if you're modeling something like, for example, uh, the um, development of a shock wave along a, a brass instrument bore, which is something that happens in trombones when you're playing at high amplitudes, then, you know, you see these kind of effects like occurring really at the shock front. So when the, the grid is, doesn't have the resolution to be able to, um, to represent the solution, then it tends to rebel and you get these oscillations occurring. So the problems that we've, you know, I would consider this to be partially solved now, um, but it's been a lot of work, um, like trying to figure out strategies for doing this in general, but I think it's, we're pretty much okay now. And then there's real time. So this is the very last thing I'm gonna talk about today. Um, so uh, I just wanted to show, this is our, one of our latest uh, sort of attempts at a plugin. So this is still in beta uh, form, um, but from physical audio, we're gonna be putting out a kind of a prepared piano synthesizer. And this you can actually do in real time. So you can get about, I don't know, 25 strings and about an equal number of um, connector elements. Those are represented as little spheres here. Um, and you can get this running in real time. Now, the real problem that we're facing now has to do with the parameter space. Because, you know, if you remember, like a string required about, I don't know, five or six parameters uh, in order to characterize it. Here we've got 25 of them. And on top of that, we've got a whole bunch of these um, connector elements too. So we're looking at a parameter space that's bigger than about 200. And like at present, we, we're looking for ways to try to simplify this for the sake of the user. You know, We don't want the user to be exposed to 200 parameters in the interface. So we're looking at you know, heuristic ways of dealing with this, like, um, like grouping the parameters or like trying to find you know, which parameters actually have an effect on the sound and or which ones don't maybe and can be sort of neglected. Um, but really, like it would be nice to have a more systematic approach to trying to, to cut this down actually to something manageable. Um, but I'll just play you a couple of examples. Uh, nonetheless, you can sort of hear what's going on here. So this is, um, uh, this is the plugin in operation. And this, I think, is an example of just very simple strings, but then uh, the Craig, who's the, um, the guy who turned this into a plugin, is going to be adjusting the stiffness of one of those connector elements. see it in that example I mean one of the weird things that happens with these instruments is that if you you play with those knobs like normally when you're using a plugin you're used to things reverting like when if you move a knob in one direction and then move it back you're back to where you started but here like sometimes that's not the case like you end up in a in a different timbre space uh, permanently so you kind of have to watch it there's like kind of new issues in terms of uh, like performance and control there um, here's another one. This is, I think, for a, oh yeah, this is a bowed string uh, example. So he's going to um, set a constant uh, bowing speed in, uh, in play there, and then we'll play around with the parameters, I think. <laughs>
one last example. Like here's a really weird one. So um, this system is kind of like a prepared piano, right? So we've got you know loads of these elements that are able to rattle and that are interconnected between the various strings. So what you can do is you can set it up and just uh, play, say, one set of notes and then allow the sound to evolve. And it um, it's quite interesting. Like you can get like changes in the sound over periods of um, minutes, actually, after you've um, struck the notes. It'll just continue to evolve. Um, and like very slight variations in how you um, like how you hit the keys initially will will lead to big variations later on in the sound. So. Um, like again, there are all sorts of weird performance here and repeatability and stuff, performance issues, right? So like, how are you going to use this? <laughs> like if you have to like very precisely hit the keys each time you play it. Um, so I'll just play you one example here of that. <laughs> So some, I mean, some musicians that we worked with have found like, made a sort of a positive out of this. So there's one guy here named Tom Mudd. He's a lecturer in um, in our department here. But he's um, he sort of says, well, you know, it sort of takes like it makes it my job a little bit easier because you know, he can just sort of hit the notes and then allow the the thing to evolve, and then he can get sort of a piece out of that somehow just by whatever the whatever the system is doing randomly. Um, Okay, um, so I think that is actually it. So um, I will stop sharing now. <laughs>